board. Um, Ryan, are you keyed up? If, if we would just uh, self mute, and Brian will start with the uh, pledge, please. Join me in the pledge, if you would. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible with liberty and justice for all. Folks, that 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 reading is a an honor of a man named Ed Bianchi, who worked for the Ziegler Corporation for many years. And he was noticing that when we put one nation, we paused, then we said under God. So he decided that he'd take upon himself to change that. So he said, when we get to one nation, we don't pause, we say one nation under God. And then he told us why. He said, we're going to say it like that until they come and arrest us. <laughs> uh, Ed Miyake. Well, folks, we're in for a treat. Kelly, uh, we haven't met, but Kelly, Kelly Calabri sent me her, her, her bio. And here it is. <laughs> and she got a, she's done a few things. Let's see. She's been a puppet, a pauper, a pirate. No, health coach, helping people to overcome <laughs> stuck places. She's a corporate fitness center instructor and manager, a bestseller of books. She approaches uh, all things from the, uh, the spirit, the mind, the body. Uh, she has two college age students. And on Thursday, she works. Kelly, it's an amazing bio. We're looking forward <laughs> to it. Welcome to the Ziggler Devotion. We'll turn it over to you. Oh, Brian, thank you so much. It is an honor to be here. I've been a uh, participant, but never a speaker. And I want to thank my friend Jim Gardner for inviting me here and recommending me to speak. And I'm just thrilled and, and love you, Jim, and, and all my new friends here for showing up. And I would love to open in prayer, if that's okay. Um, Father God, we just thank you that you are a good, good God. You are near. You are powerful. You are pursuing us. You are sovereign. And Father God, right now, I'm asking that you just open heaven over everyone here that's just representing the world and let your angels descend and be among us. And Father God, say that you would use me as a vessel, as a vehicle, that I would open my mouth and what you would want would come out. You know where everyone is today. You know all things and that they would receive what they need to hear today and that it would give them hope and it would encourage them. God, you say you will do more than we can ask, think, or imagine. So we're saying today, press down, shaken together, overflowing, just be with us. We want to honor you with this time. I thank you for everyone here today for taking the time to uh, commit to learning and developing and, and for Zig and his family and his legacy. We just thank you that that was the, the glue that brought us all together here and that these messages would multiply out and the signs and wonders would follow everyone everywhere they go today. We ask these things in Jesus name. So um, Lori asked me what I wanted to speak about and what came to mind, because I always like to stop and consider that and considering what was going on in my life and probably anyone who's breathing their lives in the world is talking about grief but then how do we turn that into unstoppable resilience? I mean, anyone who has lived any amount of time has experienced some grief and that looks different for all of us because we all have a different walk. We all have a different plan and a purpose on our life. So when I was going through some of my deepest, darkest grief, someone shared with me something called the grief cycle. And with all of my years of study and personal development, I had never come across this but it was so revelatory to me. I mean, Jesus says in the world, you will have trouble. You will struggle. You can guarantee it. You're going to be like a lamb sent out to the wolves. It's going to be difficult. There's going to be pain. There's going to be suffering. So if there is, we have a choice with what we do with that. So having some information, some knowledge and wisdom about when the hard times come can be written really, really helpful. So I wanted to first start by sharing what is this cycle of grief and, and how does it start and how do we adjust in a healthy way on the other side of it? And so grief really starts with some loss, some shock, some hurt. There's something that's unexpected, meaning it did not meet up with the expectations we had. I mean, how many people have the life they thought they'd have? <laughs> None of us, right? And all of our stories look completely different from what we thought. And there's things that we never wanted to be in our stories, but we were given those things to bear and to carry. 
So we know they're coming and there's going to be loss and shock and hurt. And there's different degrees of that. There's some that are bigger than others. I mean, there's, there's accidents, there's uh, things get stolen, partnerships fall apart, and you can have similar things happen to the same people, but they handle them very differently. Two people can have their houses burned down. Two people can lose a child or go through a divorce, but you'll notice that people handle them differently. Some people have that ability to overcome. So once this initial loss and shock happens, your body physiologically almost goes numb. It's like a protective mechanism where you have to stop and pause. And whether it's something that was unexpected and, and tragic or something that was sort of, sort of a slow fade that happened over time, but this numbness hits your body and it, it's intentional. God designed things. There were no mistakes when he made our physiology, our emotions and our, our soul made up of our mind, our will and our emotions. So there's this time of numbness where you get a pause. And then after the numbness, there's denial, like, wait a minute, this is not happening. This cannot be happening to me or to my loved ones or I, I I just don't even, I don't even want to deal with this. You're just in denial. It's unbelievable to your brain because it's not lining up. So there's this denial. And, and I will say that this grief cycle, it's not like this. It just happens in a row. It It's all over. It is the most squiggly thing. And you can also have setbacks and be triggered and and jump to different emotions. I'm going to give them to you in order, but just know they don't happen in order necessarily. <laughs> then there's emotional outbursts. And you might say, Kelly, I'm not really an emotional outburst person. And, and maybe you're not. I'm not. I wasn't ever, but I'm a journaler. And so when I went back and I read some of the things that I had written during those darkest times, there was emotion that was part of it. Even though I wasn't out loud shouting, that might not be you, but you might be keeping it in. You might be journaling it out, but there's some something that rises up in you that goes, wait a minute, this is wrong. This doesn't line up. And that could come from a number of different places, but no emotion will rise up in you. And then the next part is anger. And you might say, Kelly, I'm not an angry person either. I wasn't either, but God gave us something that he calls enmity. And it's a holy, violent anger. And we are designed to hate things that are wrong. So we're designed to hate death, murder, abortion, rape, uh, pedophilia, pornography. I mean, anything that is separate from God, anything that is sin, anything that puts that distance in there, we are designed to hate it and get angry with a holy, violent hate. God wants us to rise up and stand up. Like it should make our spirit angry when things don't line up with God. So there's that anger. Another emotion feeling phase in this grief cycle is fear. And fear is kind of what everything backs up to, because we start to get afraid about what is the future going to look like? We're not in control here. <laughs> we realize that, wow, there's a lot less we can control than we can't control. So it puts fear in us. And that comes from the enemy. That's where he loves to just sneak in when some unexpected, you know, stress or trauma or disappointment comes up. And now he can start to lie to us. Now he can tell us you're not good enough. You're not going to recover from this. You don't have the resources you need or whatever those lies are that run through our head. And he wants to keep us there and keep us stuck there and stopped in fear. Once you move on from fear, you start searching and that's where you go. Okay, wait a minute. I, I do have some resources here. How can this look? How can I take this and make something good from it? And so your brain starts to go, okay, what, what do I have available to me? What community, what money, what things do I have? How can I do something different with this? So your brain is searching and that's good. Then there's 
disorganization. So it can get chaotic then where you're trying to figure out what is my next step and how do I do this and what do I do first and how do I organize this before you get started with something new, it can be chaotic. So that that's normal and it's okay. I personally don't love chaos. I have friends who do. They start businesses all the time because they love the chaos of that beginning of starting a business. So this is just part of it. These are things that strengthen and grow us. After the disorganization and chaos, then there could be panic. <laughs> that's when you're like, okay, oh my goodness, what am I doing here? This is so unfamiliar. I've never done this before. I don't know if I can. I don't know if it's in me. What about all these other things? And you know, we don't take that lightly. There's people who do really have panic attacks and you know, panic again, God uses all of this. There's a reason for it. And it's all for our benefit. All of it is part of the, the growth and the strength. But there's a time where you're like, okay, I'm on the cliff. Do I make this jump? Do I do this? Do I partner with this person? Do I invest in this? Do I rebuild? And so there's that little bit that rises up in you that's like, okay. Then there can also be guilt. And you're riding through this guilt going, okay, am I taking away from something else to do this? Um, did I cause this? What did I, what was my part? Do I hold the mirror up and go, wow, you know, was there something that I did? And has this been on repeat? Have I found myself in this same, not a season, but a cycle where I just keep going round and round and round with the same issue, whether it's health or finances or relationships or professionally, there may be some guilt in there because you might need to take something from somewhere to put somewhere else. And there's a, a burden of responsibility that's on there. The next step in this grief cycle is loneliness. And sometimes, as I'm assuming many of you may be entrepreneurs or even as leaders in C-suites or even in family, you can feel lonely where you're just not sure whether you self-isolate and you think, okay, I'm going to muscle this out and figure this out alone, or you take your time with God and you sit with him because he's jealous for that and he loves that. And you need to get away. You need to be set apart. You need time to think and shut out the world and stop taking input from everyone else. Because sometimes we love to do that um, some of it is seeking wisdom. Some of it is a form of procrastination. Some is creating drama. So we need to shut all that out. Part of it is get away, get alone, but there's always a ditch to everything. There's an unhealthy side of being alone where you can really self-isolate and stay stuck there and shut people out. Um, and then there's the healthy side of it where you get alone with God and you can hear things and get revelation from things. So that loneliness and, and isolation is sort of the bottom of this grief cycle. If you can imagine, it's this sort of a U curve. So in this time, we don't want to stay in any of these too long, but we want to stay long enough that we learn the lesson and we get strengthened and encouraged by it. After isolation is depression. And depression actually means you're on the upswing from the grief, which sounded crazy to me. I'm like, how could depression be good? How can this be on the way to improvement? Because depression is pressing things down. But again, it's part of it. It's part of being set aside. It's part of going through the emotions and the feelings and also a time to reflect of what's working and what's not working. Depression is a place where you get to rise up from. So it is the valley of the shadow of death, but you're not there alone. Jesus is always with you. He never leaves you. He never forsakes you, but it could also be part of that rest where you're pressed down, where God is telling you to be still. And we want to do it in the healthiest way possible, where that's where we're feeding ourselves truth, light, scriptures, love, in that time where we're down. After the depression, you start to re-enter. 
It's like, okay, now I'm looking at my troubles a little bit differently. I have some new information. I'm stepping out from the depression. I'm re-entering. I'm making some choices. I'm making some decisions. And I'm starting to put one foot in front of the other. And that, that's a, a good place walking out of the grief. The next step after the re-entry from the trouble is the newness. This is where it gets fun. That's where it's new relationships. So maybe you cut some people out who they're no longer in your intimate circle. The people you do life with, the most intimate people, there's only a handful of those. And you want the best people in your intimate space. And some people get moved out to, you know, there's, there's zones of friends and then there's the people that are cannot influence you anymore, that need and should be pushed to the outside. They were part of a different season of your life, but now they're not going to be in your ear, in your most intimate inner circle space. Then there's also new strengths that you develop. You're like, wow, I didn't realize I had this in me. I developed this through this grief, through this hardness, through this difficulty, and I do have some new muscle in this area. And maybe I'm a wiser advisor or financial decisions, or there's something that you gained by going through this difficulty. There's also new patterns. We know that everything starts with our beliefs and the belief then becomes a thought. The thought is something that we speak. Once we speak it out into, it leaves our, our vocal cords, and it goes out into the world, it now has power. We know the power of words. When the word is spoken, now we start to line up with that. We start to act on the words that we speak. When we're acting on the words that we speak, now we start to do those habitually. 95% of what we do after the age of 35 is habit. It's habitual. It becomes like Groundhog Day with very little variation for most people, not High achievers, super achievers, successful people, but most people do things habitually. And once it becomes a habit, now it becomes your identity. And that's who you are. That's what you line up with in every area of your life. And you have this for every area of your life. And if you were to look at all the areas physically, financially, emotionally, socially, relationally, spiritually, professionally, some areas you're an eight, nine, or 10, and other areas you might be a zero, one, or two. So maybe you're a superstar in business and investing, but your health isn't great. Or maybe your health is a priority, but your family's falling apart. So you can do this grief in each wellness garden of your life and take a look at it because it, it happens in every area of your life. So now you have new strengths. So maybe you have new strengths in your health, in your relationships or wherever the grief has been for you. And then you have these new patterns. And then you have new hope. You resurrect with new hope, new joy from whatever the initial grief was. And then that starts to get affirmed in your life because you start to see it because now you're looking for it. You're like, yes, okay. I'm, I'm putting this behind me and I'm getting affirmed with hope, with new things. <laughs> And then ultimately, when you get to the highest level of overcoming the grief, it's when you're helping others. It's when you can take that loss, when you can take that difficulty, when you can take that hard, unreasonable, most difficult thing and use it to help others. And, and I'll share one brief story with you. Um, I was married for 25 years. It was my identity. Being a wife, I just valued that so, so much. And my husband of 25 years came home and he said, my commitment to our marriage is zero. And he left in a moment. It floored me. And I got served divorce papers very quickly. It was actually on my birthday. 30 days later, we were, we were divorced. And in a minute, he was reengaged and remarried. And it floored me, took me to my knees. And I went on a three-year healing sabbatical. And I did all the things that I could possibly do for those three years, including getting certified by the American Association of Christian Counselors as a divorce coach. And so when I felt like I had arrived as much as I could on the other side in a healthy way, and of course the healing continues, I asked the Lord, what do, what do I do with this? And he said, I want you to help other people walk through this cycle of grief. 
uh, through divorce. So I started teaching divorce care at the church and through teaching divorce care, so much more freedom and healing came from me. So that's just one example of how you can take something difficult and do something beautiful with it and help other people who are behind you who have not yet gained the hope and the strength that you have in whatever area that it was for you. So um, I'd like to just kind of pause for a minute there. Now that we've talked about the grief, there may be something I'd like to do a little exercise that you're thinking about that's been the grief in your life, the hard thing, the difficult thing could be in any area of your life. It could be recent or it could be older if it's still impacting you, if you're still not over it. If there's still a root of bitterness there or something else that when you think of this thing, it has you gripped in, in fear, in depression, in hopelessness, you are stuck or stopped in some place in this grief cycle because you haven't moved on. Um, would everyone be okay if we did an exercise? A little exercise, play along? Okay, good. So if you can, uh, and if you, you're welcome to close your eyes. This is a very safe space here. This is only going to be a couple minutes, but I would love for you, if you're comfortable, to close your eyes and think about what that thing is. And it's the thing that pops right into your spirit. Maybe it's not the biggest thing. Maybe it's not the oldest thing, but it's something right now that is grieving you. That is just a, just a, a deep grief. And if you know what that is, if you want to just raise your hand or just kind of nod to yourself, what I would love you to do is to take that thing, whatever it is, and to give it either a picture, an image, a word, something that represents what this thing is for you. Just I'm going to just go silent for a little bit and think of what this grief could look like. Now, if you have a picture of what it would look like, it might be a word, um, an image, I'd like you to imagine it in your hands. So it's, you can actually hold whatever that is that represents the grief in your hands. Now, I like to go to the highest possible place that I could imagine, and that's heaven. So if you could imagine yourself standing in heaven, with Jesus, and in your hands is this thing that represents the grief, the hardness, the darkness, the thing that has you stuck, angry, stopped, it was unjust. Whatever that thing is, can you take it in your hands and hand it to Jesus? Now notice what Jesus does with it. Now Jesus is a really, really good God and he is the giver of all gifts. So when you give him something, he's going to give you something in return. So ask Jesus what he has for you. You can ask Jesus what that means if you don't know. You can ask him what he wants you to do with it. You can ask him how he sees you. And just spend another 30 seconds there with that.
Okay. I mean, I, I would love to stay in heaven right there all day with you. I hope that that exercise, which I call the exchange, um, you felt that in your, your soul that you had a great encounter and a great exchange there. Know that you can do that anytime. You can repeat that anytime with anything big or small. And I, I just love to do those exchanges. It's been so profound to me, so healing, so intimate. And um, God's always going to show up and he's always going to give you something good back. He'll always take the hard things, the heavy things, the difficult things. Your, your yoke is light. He'll take the burdens from you and he'll give you something great back. So I don't know if we have time at the end to, to share anything, but I would like to now shift into the second part, which is getting beyond the grief, doing this exchange. And now how do we build that unstoppable resilience? Would that be okay with everyone? We have some time still? Okay, good. Okay, so whoever told you life was going to be easy, they lied to you. <laughs> it was not going to be easy. It's going to be tough. And when you study the most successful people, the, the thing that they have is hope and grit. It's both. <laughs> you need, I love Bill Johnson. He says, we have two choices. You can either do or you can rest. If you're not sure which one to do, pick one. If it doesn't work, pick the other. So you're either doing or you're resting and you, you can, you can do both. And we know, as I said before, in Romans, the testing does produce the resilience, the character, the hope. We were mentioning movies earlier. I don't know if anyone has seen that movie Unbroken. It's the life about uh, Louis Zamperini. And when you think about unstoppable resilience, my goodness, is there Another man who just has been through so much, what a story of survival and, and getting knocked down, you know, a hundred times and getting up a hundred and one, you know, and whether you've been knocked down 10 and you need to get up 11, but if you have not seen that story, it's a, it was a World War II um, prisoner of war, absolutely tortured in the most horrific ways. He was also an Olympic athlete, but it's a story of resilience and redemption and triumph and just not quitting. And if you think for a moment, what you have is hard, I, I watch a movie like that and go, wow, I've got nothing. I don't have to look very far to see people who give me zero reason to complain or get back up. But if you want to get better, you need bigger problems to solve. I feel like that may be something Zink may be said. <laughs> uh, he, he probably did, but it is, is true. Your problems optimize who you are. And if you look at the people who ha have overcome, they, they're some of the wisest people with the best possible character. And there are seasons where we are given some really hard, dark things to walk through, and they're stressful, and they're traumatic. And we've all heard of post-traumatic stress, but have you heard of post-traumatic growth? What I will tell you is they can coexist. You can have post-traumatic stress, trauma, and post-traumatic growth at the same time. And you do it by finding a new meaning from this experience, from the hardness. And you're able to be better than you were post-trauma because of the trauma. So look for the growth rather than the stress that comes from the hard things. And again, we need some stress. Stress can be good. We can't just all lay in a hammock with, you know, being fed martinis or grapes or margaritas or whatever it is people like. That's not how we grow. We grow from the hard things. We grow from the tension and the stress. We are not called to live this comfortable, small life. We're called to be bold, to courageous, to, to step out. So Look at what your beliefs are about trauma. When something hard happens, what's your go-to? What do you do? Do you isolate? Do you get depressed? Do you, you do something, and that's how you have learned to cope with hard things. But can you get to this other side to readjust in a healthy way? And the more you do this, it's like a muscle. You don't fall as long, as deep, as hard, as fast as you used to when hard things happen because you've built that muscle. You know, you put on your Superman cape and you're you get your Wonder Woman stance out and you go, okay, I've seen this before. I, it's not going to take me as long. I, I have a friend who uh, lives in Mauritius, a tiny little island. He's, he's like the mayor there. He has been bankrupt nine times. And he said, if I get bankrupt a 10th time, I will know what to do. You know, I will, I'll do it better, faster. 
And so um, the greater the pain, the greater the potential for growth. I mean, probably some of your best friends of people who have overcome some hard things. That's who I want to be in the foxhole with. That's who I want to spend time with, the people who know how to get back up and be resilient and gritty. So surround yourself with those people, which you have here in this group, and I'm sure probably every walk of life, but get those people in the areas where you're struggling. If you're struggling in your physical health, your financial health, get around those people who've overcome. They figured it out. They got back up again. And then you need to speak truth. If you're lying to yourself in that area, you're going to stay down. You're going to stay in grief. You're going to stay depressed. You need to shine light and scripture and truth. So the iron sharpening iron and the time getting away with God to do that. Renewing your mind, renewing your mind, renewing your mind every single day, getting up and challenging your beliefs and saying, is this true or am I believing a lie? And the scriptures are where we go to get the truth. So shine that on your grief and see what you get from it. If you want to build your resilience, look for miracles. They're out there. They're happening every single day. And I started tracking them. I don't know about you, but I write them down. There are miracles every single day. God is orchestrating so many things that we have no idea. And when we're in the, the darkest, deepest depths and the, the pit, they're still happening. You just have to look for them and record them and share them. They're part of your testimonial. God is still in the healing business. He's still in the miracle making business, even when it's hard and tough and there's grief. And the grief is real. It is guttural. It is a tearing of your soul sometimes. I mean, especially in something like a divorce, the first thing God brought together, the first covenant was marriage. And the first thing the enemy wants to do is divide it. If he can divide a family, he can divide finances and make it generational. And, and so we need to you know, pull that back together and, and shine light and look for the miracle in it. When it's hard, when it's new, when it's fresh, it's hard to say what's good about this, but that is a better question to ask than why me? What's good about this? And the quicker you can ask that, the quicker you'll rise back up and do something great with it. And so uh, gratitude, I know you've heard this so many times, but I'll, I'll share what I did with gratitude. In my darkest season, I decided that I was going to find things to be grateful for every day. And I, I committed to filling a page in a journal, and it was a big journal, every single day. And I wasn't going to go to sleep until it was full. And initially, it was really mechanical. It was like, well, I took my vitamins, check. I walked the dog, check. And it was just very rote and mechanical. But then I said, okay, if you're going to go throughout your day and you have to fill that page at night, you better start looking for things all day long to be grateful for. And it was just like this wonder and awe open to me. I go, what? I get to speak on Zig Ziglar's Monday morning devotional. Are you kidding me? I mean, less than 0.0001% of the people in the whole world get to do that. That's going in my book. And when you start going throughout your day going, wow, I get to talk to this teller at the grocery store or whatever. I mean, God is orchestrating so many things. You, you go outside and you see a tree in a pond and God created this all in a, in a breath. I mean, it's incredible. And when I started to do that, it was like I turned this receiver on, that things just started coming to me that were incredible. So I started writing down the things that I was receiving. Like someone took me to lunch and bought me a bowl of soup. A friend drove me to the airport. Uh, someone had an extra ticket to the concert and invited me. And, and every day I started to write that down and it just opened up the flow of God's kingdom. It was like, okay, this is how kingdom works. You're, you're grateful and you're giving and you're receiving. And so I started putting a number on the things I received. Well, that bowl of soup was $12. Well, I would have paid $60 to go Uber to the airport. And that concert ticket, that was a good seat. That was a you know $75 ticket. And at the end of, I'll tell you last year, because I've been doing this now for a few years, the total was $298,471. That's God's kingdom. That's being in gratitude. That's turning on your receiver. And prior to that, I was a giver. And I'm still a very generous giver. But if you bought me one dinner, I, had a, I owed you. I had to buy you three dinners. If you took me to the airport, I was going to take your whole family to the airport for eternity. And I wasn't good at receiving. 
And so turning on this receiver just helped me to build my joy muscle like it never has been before. And joy is a muscle that you have to build. So the joy is inside us, but we have to give ourselves the permission to let it out. And giving had always been a joy to me, but when you give and give and give and give, and give eventually you're empty and you can become bitter and resentful. And now when someone wants to give me something, I am so thankful and so happy and so such a good receiver because I don't want to steal their joy of giving. And that builds resilience. When you believe that you're going to get up every day and go out and you're going to give to the best that you can where you are led to give generously, but it, it's God's kingdom for it to come back to you. You can't outgive God. He is the best giver there is. So I know we say gratitude. We just put that on a list of things to do. It is a superpower. I mean, go and study the science of gratitude. My goodness, there's, I mean, it affects your brain chemistry. It's, it affects your energy. So the signs and wonders of gratitude follow you where you go. If you want to build resilience, I'll also say get in nature get outside, get your feet in the sand, in the dirt, stand by water, just get in the awe of this earth and this universe that God created. And you see there's things bigger than me and bigger than my problems. And your problems get smaller when your God gets bigger. Another thing that's so helpful to get out of grief is to serve. And when you go out and you serve others, it is healing to your heart. It gets you out of your problems. You see there's people with so much less than you have, and you're doing it for the kingdom. We are called to be servants, and it will get you out of your problems. And you don't know what you what's God's going to do when you get there to serve someone else. You wind up being ministered to, and it, it's just so beautiful. I will also say to stay in the grief long enough. Don't rush out of it. So don't be the one that sticks your head in the sand and pretend it isn't happening or just skip it. You know, for example, using divorce, there's many people who will jump right back into another relationship while well, you're taking that same person with those same issues and you're just bringing it to the next relationship. And you're probably attracting the person with the same issues that the last one had. And again, that's, that's just a relationship example. You can apply it to anything else. Stay in it. There's lessons to be learned there. I know it's hard. I know we don't like it, but look for what's good in it and how am I being strengthened? How am I being built? So don't rush the grief. Um, in the example of marriage, counselors will say, you know, for every five years you were married, wait a year. Um, I've been divorced five years. I haven't dated yet. And I'm, I'm so at peace with that. I'm just enjoying God being my husband and I'm covetous and jealous of this time and not in a rush. I've gotten through that deep grief, but now I'm in this season and I'm, I want to stay here. I love and value marriage. I, I'm confident I'll be married again one day, but I'm not rushing it. I'm staying in this singleness season because I'm just adoring it. Um, so know the power of one. If you're in grief, it could be one more phone call, one appointment, one new person you're going to meet, one person that believes in you, one person that offers you an opportunity. You could be that one step away from gold. So be looking for that one thing when you're in the depths of the grief. Again, faithful with a little and, and watch what happens with what God will do it and multiply things. And then I, I know we're, we're getting late here, so I'll, I'll wrap it up. But the people who are future-minded, the ones who have vision, those are the ones who don't perish. So there's some hope you have in the future. We only get today. Today will never happen again. Today is all we're guaranteed. But it's the ones who can start to, we know Zig was so big about goal setting. So start to put your mind in the future, not in a way that puts you in fear, but in a way that gives you hope. A way that you can, I mean, even Holocaust survivors, they knew the ones who would survive were the ones who were thinking about being reunited with their families. So plan that resurrection, plan that celebration, celebrate every day, but imagine this future where things are better than they are today because of the hard things that happen. And you get to create that. I mean, you and God, he's got nothing but good plans for you to prosper you and not to harm you. So it's okay. The enemy would like you not to think of the future, but God wants you to have vision. So if you want to get out of that grief, 
start creating a brilliant, bright, beautiful, joy-filled, hope-filled future for yourself, for your loved ones, whatever that looks like. And you get to decide every single day. I mean, you could like pound your chest. If you're feeling down, I decide. Because even the physical, the physiological, when your physiology is down and depressed, I decide, I decide. And I'll, I will do that. I will walk around my house and I, I decide. I get to make the decisions. I'm responsible for me. I'm not expecting the knight in shining armor to, to come and do it. Like I, God and me, we get to decide and everything else is just a bonus. Um, so I don't know if we want to stop there and for questions or comments, or I can close in prayer. I know we're a little bit over time. We've got time for a few questions, Leslie. I tell it that's fine. We we can plug into that. Okay, good. And, and just remember, you're not defined by your grief. No one is defined by their grief or or your failures. You're defined by what you overcame. The two things I really picked up on is I need to lay in a hammock and get fed martinis and take Kelly out to dinner. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I will. It's a I'll receive the invitation. I uh, about six months after my mother passed away, um, all of a sudden something hit me, and I remember being in, in church just crying uncontrollably. And uh, you know, I've experienced uh, everything you talk about, and you've just you've done a really nice job of piecing this together. And I really liked what you said about uh, being open to receiving, because in this season that I'm in right now, I've had to experience that, and I'm I'm ready to get back to the other side. So. Uh, thank you so much for everything you've said and done today. Oh, thank you, Tim. Kelly, a couple of things that, that came out when Zig lost his daughter, he searched for a way to handle this grief and this despair. He really didn't find it. And so he wrote the book, The Confessions of a Grieving Christian in which, uh, Laura, you know how many of those books he sent out for free and how many lives those, those have touched. But Jig also said a couple of things that rang true. If there's hope in the future, there's power in the present. Yes. And then when you talk about uh, gratitude, he, he always said gratitude is the healthiest of all emotions. Yes. And he proved that, and he lived the most consistent man I've ever met but he, he, he lived that and put on his, his wall of gratitude. If you would ever go to the Zig Ziglar new office or old offices, there are all these people that had an impact in his life that he was grateful that they came into his life. A uh, cu couple of things, and then you could close in prayer, Kelly. Thank you. A uh, couple of things. Uh, Jacqueline has volunteered her office, and I think a three course breakfast, a three, we're going to have, okay. Uh -huh. Co coffee and donuts. I'm sorry. I, I missed that. But the first Monday, if you're in the Dallas area, if you would like to join us in face-to-face -face fellowship as we watch the devotion as a group in her, her office or I guess her conference room there on Midway in the Addison area of North Texas, North Dallas, we'd love to have you. And that's the first Monday, which would be, Laura, that'd be next Monday. Next, next Monday. <laughs> I'm, I'm okay, I'll, I'll I check my calendar. calendar. And guys, the other thing is, we <laughs> we all encounter, we all encounter God sightings and God encounters. This week, I was bemoaning the fact that I'm in a basket and I don't know where I'm going, you know, as a country, as a world, maybe. Oh. And my buddy, my buddy up in Idaho said, "Planigan, this this is it. Embrace this. This is your this is your your, your new motto." <clears throat> It's all right. Everything works out in the end. In the end, it's okay. And if it's not okay, we're not at the end. That, that gave, thank, you some, gave me some thank, hope this weekend. Yeah, I want to thank you for this message today. Um, my brother just passed away. And you have given me a new roadmap to begin today with a new outlook. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, thank you. God bless you. So Kelly, if you would close in prayer, we'd appreciate it. Yeah. So mm -hmm. Father God, we just thank you. We thank you for this, this time and these precious people who committed to coming here and starting off their day and their week with us in this devotion time. And, and Lord, we're, we're just humbled by you and how good you are and how tender you are. Lord Jesus grieved. 
Jesus grieved for his friend Lazarus and he grieved in the temple when people were abusing it. And grief is, is something you gave us. Um, you grieve, you grieve your people, Father God. And, and we know there's a lot of grief. There's a lot of hurting people here, Father. So we just ask that you give them hope. The just the peace that surpasses all understanding would just wash over them, Father God, that every fruit of the spirit would just be highlighted. And then the love, the joy, the peace, the kindness, the gentleness, self-control, just all of it, Father, just fill every dark place. Let your Holy Spirit come and give them a refreshing and a renewing, Father God. Let them move through this grief exactly how they should do it. We know that you have them. You never leave them. You never forsake them. And, and we're just thankful, God, that you are a good, good God. Cover all these people today in their travels, wherever they go. Just let them be your greatest evangelist. Let them develop every gift that you have for them, God. And we just thank you that uh, you're the living God. You're every one of your promises is yes. And amen. We can trust you and uh, we trust you with all of our heart and we lean not on our own understanding, but God today we acknowledge you and we thank you for directing our paths. We ask all these things in Jesus name. Kelly, appreciate you. If you get a chance, please review the archive and you'll see all of the chats that were very touching and moving in the the, the point you hit it on our hearts. So we thank you for that. Well, guys, this is what we do. Come back next week. And if you want to go face to face, Jack will have the, the breakfast ready for us. Appreciate you guys. Please come back. Coffee. 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 I'm sorry, coffee. Love have a all. great week, everybody. Thank you, you so much for being and here. Thank you for being Kelly. transparent. Amazing Kelly. message. Thank you. Great. Thank, Thank you. you. It touched every one of us. Thank you. We're so grateful. Thank you for being here. Have a good week. Everybody come back next week. We'll be here in person or not. We'll be here. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Bye-bye.